Hi there, you're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Interview episode, Antiochus IV Epiphanes in the Jewish Tradition with Dr. Joseph Scales. Hello everyone, joining us on the podcast today is Dr. Joseph Scales, an independent scholar of Judaism and Jewish history. Dr. Scales focuses primarily on Second Temple Judaism between 515 BC and 70 AD, which includes the Hellenistic period. He has published articles relating to Queen Salome Alexandra of the Hasmoneans and Antiochus IV Epiphanes of the Seleucid Empire, and today he is here to talk about the portrayal and perception of Antiochus IV in the Jewish tradition. Firstly, let me just say thank you very much for taking the time to join the podcast. Thank you. I'm really excited to talk to you. Now, would you care to give us a bit about your background and how you found yourself attached to the Hellenistic period as relating to Jewish history? Sure. So I kind of started doing degrees in theology and religion, kind of with a particular interest in biblical studies, particularly lots of New Testament. I was interested in learning Greek, so I read the New Testament in its quote-unquote original form, let's say. And as I kind of pursued undergrad degrees and a master's degree, I became more and more interested in cultural background to lots of these texts. So what was happening in the history, other comparative texts, things like archaeology, and moved over from an initial interest, let's say, in the New Testament into a kind of broader interest in all things what we would term uh, late Second Temple period Judaism, which is a little bit of a slightly odd term to people outside of kind of ancient Jewish studies or biblical studies, because we are, as as you pointed out, the dates, we kind of date ourselves within the time period when the so-called Second Temple in Jerusalem stood. And this is kind of after the exile, the Babylonian exile that's in the Hebrew Bible. Ezra and Nehemiah has this kind of story about coming back to Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple. So we're at the beginning of the second temple period there. And it goes right the way up to the destruction of the second temple. Well, the second temple is also a bit of a misnomer because there are remodelings, different rulers, including some of them we'll talk about today in the Hasmonean family, kind of expanded, adapted the temple at various times. Anyway, all that aside, the so quote-unquote second temple is destroyed in 70 CE by the Romans when they're engaging in the war against Judeans. And then this is almost a distinct period to study, but often scholars drift outside of those kind of historical bounds. So I kind of place myself quite firmly in that kind of latter half, with my interests now really being in broadly from the beginning of the 2nd century BCE and then right the way up to end of the 1st century CE and maybe a little beyond. But it's really grown out of initially being interested in kind of biblical texts and then now much of my research is in texts which you may or may not find in a Bible, so things like the book of Judith and other texts that ancient authors wrote and were variously preserved or not preserved in some cases. Yeah, that's a little bit about kind of my background. And then the Hellenistic period as situating point for a lot of this research really is about thinking about the wider world in which early Judaism emerged. We will talk about some of this because Antiochus IV is a figure who really, in some of the ways he's discussed, raises lots of issues in terms of how we think about ancient identity and we think about ancient culture. So I'm I'm sure we'll come on to this, but essentially that uh, Judaism emerging in the Hellenistic period in particular forms is a a useful way to kind of think about how ancient people lived and what they thought and believed and just considering the ancient Jews as one people amongst many in the ancient world. And Hellenism as like a lens is really useful to think about that particularly for my own work. Thanks to his presence in the biblical narrative and his tumultuous relationship with the Maccabees, it is probably no surprise that Antiochus IV is probably one of, if not the most well-known member of the Seleucid dynasty. Before we begin our discussion, could you clarify on which Jewish authors and works cover Antiochus's reign and the interactions with Judea? Sure. These will have to be kind of fairly brief initially, um, but I'll just cover the main ones and there are a variety of other sources, Jewish and non-Jewish, which cover him. 
So firstly, there's the book of Daniel, which most people will probably be familiar with. One of the, let's say, prophetical books in the Hebrew Bible. And Daniel is a slightly strange one because Antiochus isn't mentioned by name at all in the book, but is alluded to. So we can kind of split the book of Daniel into two halves. The first half seems to be a bit older. It's so-called Babylonian court tales. So lots of them revolve around Daniel himself engaging you know with various other officials in the Babylonian Empire in this kind of period of exile and then the second half these chapters 7 to 12 are a series of quite odd visions that are Daniel is reputed to have had and they often are very symbolic and form the basis of what scholars have kind of come to think of as uh, apocalyptic literature and we can probably circle back to that a bit later and talk about that but these chapters 7 to 12 contain lots of coded is probably a good way to think about it but coded references to Antiochus so if I just pick up here from Daniel 7 1 then uh, in the first year King Belshazzar of Babylon Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed then he wrote down the dream I Daniel saw in my vision by night four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea some beasts come along, lion, all these other kind of things. They're all different manifestations. After I saw in the vision by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that had preceded it and it had ten horns. So this beast, scholars think, refers to the Seleucid Empire. And then these ten horns are ten rulers of the Seleucids. Then in verse 8, I was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one coming up among them to make room for it. Three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots. There were eyes like human eyes in this horn and a mouth speaking arrogantly. So this little horn becomes this kind of figure in Daniel that comes up in a couple of these visions. And we think that this refers to Antiochus IV. A number of elements that his reference to plucking up other horns by the roots. He came to power in this kind of slightly shady way. His older brother dying, not young, but not old. And him very quickly replacing him on the throne. So scholars and even ancient figures have kind of felt yeah, this was an usurpation of Seleucid throne. And then we have this mouth speaking arrogantly. Antiochus is known in lots of the Jewish sources for his arrogance. So particularly Second Maccabees picks this up again. But that's throughout Daniel. And then you'll see kind of in later chapters of Daniel. Let's take a look at Daniel 11. We have this long vision of the king of the north, the king of the south. This is really referring to the Syrian wars as they go on, so these wars between the Seleucids and Ptolemies. And then we really get into some detail here and reading between uh, what this text is trying to convey really from verse 30 and we'll come on to this a bit later as well but this is Daniel 11 verse 30 talks about the ships of the Kittim who are the Romans they come against him he shall lose heart and withdraw this is referring to his withdrawal from Egypt we'll cover all this a bit later but just to set the scene then in verse 31 he profanes the temple and sets up the abomination that makes desolate or the abomination of desolation which is a great band name all these other kind of things that it's detailing puts people to the sword some of the wise shall fall so they'll be refined and purified and cleansed until the time of the end for there is still an interval until that time is appointed the king shall act as he pleases he shall exalt himself and consider himself greater than any god and shall speak horrendous things against the god of gods all of that is about Antiochus all of this mirrors historical things we know that kind of kick off firstly his persecution of the Jews and then the Maccabean revolt and then this chapter 11 takes a hard right turn and starts to talk about how he's going to die and all these other wars that's going to happen and none of that actually ended up happening we kind of know uh, the end that Antiochus came to so we have this break really in the the narrative up to a point even in symbolic language follows quite closely what we know happened to him and then after a point in chapter 11 it goes off on a tangent and this is one way in which scholars dated the book of Daniel to probably sometime around 165 BCE so all this stuff we know has happened and then they're predicting what will happen in the future and then none of that does happen Daniel's a really interesting one an early source even a contemporaneous source perhaps on Antiochus 
The other major ones are the books of the Maccabees. Two in particular are of interest for this discussion. There's First Maccabees. Both of these books, incidentally, will occupy quote unquote apocrypha. They'll be in there. These are the other books written in Greek. But First Maccabees is kind of like a, a court chronicle, maybe, let's say, or some kind of annals or really just propaganda for the Hasmonean ruling family. The book really is about promoting a lot of this first generation and their defence and rededication of the temple. So it kind of establishes these figures, this, these Hasmoneans, as important figures and protectors in early Jewish history. And First Maccabees is kind of like a straightforward narrative, really. So First Maccabees 1, again, we get a, some of this similar kind of language. So in 110, there came forth a sinful root, Antiochus Epiphanes, son of King Antiochus. He had become hostage in Rome. He began to reign in 137th year of the Kingdom of the Greeks. So this is using Seleucid calendar. So he kind of appears, he ends up detailing his attacks on Egypt, the land of the Ptolemies, and then really gets into his persecution, some of these other details. And he isn't around on the scene too much in First Maccabees. I think his death is reported in First Maccabees 6, and then it just goes on with kind of later events of the Maccabees. So he's villain number one, and then it moves on to other villains uh, of interest. The next work is Second Maccabees which contains much of the same events as First Maccabees. Some of the chronology is a bit different, some things it overlooks or doesn't include. There's a bit of argument about which one was written first, it's a bit unclear, but probably late 2nd century BC, early 1st century CE, they're both kind of been written. Second Maccabees sets itself up as an epitome of a longer work, so this is kind of a extended book report, let's say, of a five book work by Jason of Cyrene. We don't know anything about this book, as far as I'm aware, if it ever existed, but this is how Second Maccabees frames itself. Now throughout, there are a lot more, kind of almost ironically, epiphanies. So this is Antiochus, is one of his titles he takes, these epithets that many of the kings take after their names and helps us sort through all the Antiochuses and all the Ptolemies. Epiphanies are manifestations of the divine. So Second Maccabees has quite a few instances where particularly the Jewish God or angels or other kind of, let's say, heavenly forces are visible or active in the narrative. So Second Maccabees is a bit more interested in that kind of thing. And then also, perhaps, this might also be partly why the portrayal of Antiochus, they are quite specific with using one particular pun on his name. Lots of puns about Antiochus, but instead of being the Epiphanes, as he self-styles, he's the Hupophanes, or the arrogant one. There's also this kind of attack through punning. But again, we see this arrogant label given to him in Second Maccabees. The last Jewish source I'll talk about postdates uh, the books of the Maccabees by quite a way, and these are the writings of Josephus Flavius. So Josephus was a historian active in Rome in the late half, the late third really, of the first century CE. He's a very interesting figure. Most of what we know about the kind of middle period of the Hasmoneans a lot of the Herodian histories, all this kind of stuff comes from Josephus. He's a really important witness to the events of the First Jewish War because he was involved in it to some degree. He might overstate his own involvement and talk about the authority given to him and all the things he got up to, but he's a really important source for that. We know four works that he wrote that we have. The earliest of these, written kind of quite closely in the aftermath of the war, maybe within a decade of 70 and the fall of the temple, is the War of the Jews or the War of the Judeans, depending on how you want to translate this. He gives one kind of slightly more truncated account because his main interest is the events that lead up to the war, the revolt against Rome in the late 60s and 70 CE, but he starts with talking about Antiochus and he mostly seems to draw a lot of his information from First Maccabees really. And then in another work, a much longer work, book War is seven books 
um, and then in his later Jewish Antiquities, this is 20 books, um, but he talks about Antiochus kind of in book 12 and gives them slightly different information. Um, it's not terribly important to really go into lots of the details, but he also discusses Antiochus. Again, this is much more in the vein of First Maccabees. It gives, for want of a better word, like a historical account and gives us some insights into things like the other politics that were going on in the time, maybe some of the power players, and then obviously the events preceding that and the events coming after. So those are the main Jewish sources which uh, form a lot of our understanding. Now, even within the Greco-Roman sources, uh, Antiochus's reputation is less than stellar, though perhaps not for the same reasons as those like the Jewish scholars and writers of the time. How do the individual authors of 1 and 2 Maccabees or Josephus compare in their assessment of Antiochus IV as both a ruler and possibly as a symbol of Hellenization and paganism? I think I'm going to approach this in two ways. So firstly, I'll answer the question and then I will deconstruct a bit of the question. So please forgive me for that. Importantly, in terms of non-Jewish sources, Polybius is the most well known, very important for more or less all of the later sources that discuss Antiochus, most of them we think draw from him. So just a list of the other sources, we've got Diodorus, we've got Appian, we've got Pompeius Trogus, and then there's Livy, there's a handful of others who kind of end up coming later, Porphyry for instance, but they, they mostly seem to draw from Polybius. So Polybius is this historian, works are highly fragmentary really unfortunately, and in this regard, in this period they are. Polybius was contemporary to Antiochus IV. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what he says about Antiochus and then we could maybe think a little bit about how his relationship with him may have affected some of what he says. So firstly, much of his work is fragmentary, very sad, preserved in other authors. He's got a section that's very famous about Antiochus IV. I think this is in book 27. And very nicely, you can access, I think, all of Polybius's works online. So the Loeb Classical Library, which is one of the go-to sources for classicists, there is a website online where all of the Loeb's that are no longer in copyright and are thus in the public domain are free to download and read. So that might be something of interest for your listeners. This is what Polybius writes. Antiochus surnamed Epiphanes gained the name of Epimanes by his conduct. So Epimanes is the mad one, it's a pun on the manifest one. There we go, very clever Polybius. So Polybius goes on to kind of talk about Antiochus's behavior around other Seleucids, around the court. These are things like him discussing philosophy, technical matters of craftsmen, we have a story about him carrying on in a bathhouse, bathing in public, full of common people and covering himself in precious ointments or other people, this kind of stuff. Just a lot of stories which Polybius is kind of reporting to kind of show that either he is mad, is not behaving as he should, or is not a great king and doesn't conduct himself as a king. And then we also have this other important story later, I think this is preserved in book 29, which actually details incidents that really shaped a lot of Antiochus's latter half of his rule. So to put the context around this, Antiochus gains control of power in 175 BCE. Before this, he was a hostage in Rome as a result of his kind of father Antiochus III, the greats, defeat at the hands of the Romans. By this point, he has spent a decade and a half, I think 15 years maybe, in Rome, living as the Romans do, because these hostages, while if something goes wrong in terms of international relations, it could end up quite badly, they are Hellenistic royalty, and the Romans kind of culture them to their ways of living and thinking. So lots of these things, historians, particularly Otto Morkholm, who has written quite extensively on Antiochus, have kind of understood and read lots of these behaviours that Polybius is obviously not very happy about as part of Antiochus's acculturalization into kind of Roman social norms, let's say. But anyway, the Romans once again appear in his life, and this time not in such a popular way. Rome is in asserting itself as a power in the Eastern Mediterranean 
much more than we it previously was able to do so in terms of like the broad geopolitical history rome and its senate have been interested in asia minor the affairs of the hellenistic kingdoms for a while but we still predate the kind of most famous year 146 the destruction of carthage and athens so there are still other powerful political entities all around and the seleucids are one of them but the roman seleucid war then shapes the kind of ongoing political landscape in this region and then 30 years later Antiochus has invaded Egypt he's kind of doing quite well he seems to have been a capable general but just before he's able to strike the killing blow let's say a Roman commander kind of goes with the delegation and they essentially establish peace and Polybius reports the story commander called Popilius Lanius hands over this letter regarding what the senate has said you know okay we don't want fighting in this Ptolemy should be left alone hands over this report to Antiochus Antiochus after reading it said he would like to communicate with his friends about this intelligence Popilius acted in a manner which was thought to be offensive and exceedingly arrogant he was carrying a stick cut from a vine and with this he drew a circle round Antiochus and told him he must remain inside the circle until he gave his decision about the contents of the letter so after a short while Antiochus accedes withdraws from Egypt and then on his way back the events which lead to persecution of the Jews really kicks off moment of humiliation some scholars have also suggested that yeah it's probably also more hassle than it's worth running the bureaucracy down in Egypt so maybe he was just intending to show force but this is quite a say humiliating thing for the king to have gone through to put a bit more context around Polybius's reports of Antiochus I forget which league it was but Polybius was kind of on the opposing side in some wars from Antiochus and clearly just hated him I once noted that the only sources that are anywhere near contemporary to Antiochus that anything other than negative about him are his own coins but you don't get a huge amount of information from coins all our ancient sources to greater and lesser degrees are not fans of Antiochus so this really shapes a lot of our reading and how much we have to trust those sources and how much we have to reconstruct from in between the lines but that bias is definitely there with Polybius great a historian as he was the second part of the question that I kind of feel be good to get into a little bit is thinking about what do we mean by Hellenism what do we mean by paganism Judaism in this period and this is like something which could spin out into a huge discussion so we can take and leave as much of it as you kind of want but some of my research and some of my colleagues research recently has really been stressing the point that Hellenism as a concept when it's used in discussions of ancient Judaism often are essentially a way to draw a category around certain kinds of cultural output whether that's literature whether this is architecture forms of custom and use this as a kind of a way to distinguish between Judaism and other which often isn't very helpful or accurate in terms of understanding whatever might go into that other and then can have repercussions for how we think of as Judaism the kind of earliest appearance of this word as far as I'm aware Hellenism comes in 2nd Maccabees and we also have one of the first times where this is compared with Judaism as a concept perhaps now 2nd Maccabees isn't particularly antagonistic between these two things but what happens also in 1st Maccabees is that there are groups in Jerusalem who are prominent social leaders involved in the temple cult who are reported as embracing more customs and practices that you would associate with the Seleucids for instance some of it's quite vague some of it is just they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem and everything that goes along with that like naked practice and this kind of stuff we, we get some sources which make some kind of observations on cultural change and difference 
And then they also make some comments on one leader who seems to want to draw or proscribe their own sets of things that are important to the authors. So this putting together the pieces of ancient cultural practice is used to make certain arguments in the ancient texts. And then when we kind of look at the modern scholarship of this, when we think about the 19th century in particular, when lots of these things were being resurfaced, I, I have a slight uncomfortability with the way in which we have two oppositional cultural entities that have nothing to do with one another. So Hellenism on one hand, Judaism on the other. And then, as some of these 19th century scholars and some later would argue, you have the fulfilment of Hellenistic culture, art, philosophy, so on and so forth. And you have the belief structure, Judaism, and then the fulfilment is in Christianity. So part of this distinction between these kind of entities then becomes a way that you have a positionality that can bring out kind of Christian anti-Semitism. So it's just one one important thing to consider with this. This isn't to say that all culture was the same in the ancient world, but it, it's one kind of piece to think about when we, and I say this as all manner of historians and archaeologists, classicists, so on and so forth, draw category distinctions around literature. We could take, for instance, First Maccabees, as far as we know, there may have been written in Hebrew first, but it's a Greek composition. Second Maccabees, also a Greek composition. We have Jewish authors who are writing in stylistic Greek. How would you tell that someone was Jewish by looking at them in the ancient world? People dress the same, people do all these other kind of things. So this distinction that essentially I want to argue that Jewish expression in the ancient world was as Hellenistic as... Tyrian expression was as Hellenistic as Etrurian expression or all these other groups that made up this shared culture, particularly in the ancient Near East. And this wasn't something that just came with Alexander. This happened under the Persians. This happened when people were moved around by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Culture is very messy. And I think one way to reconceptualize how we talk about Judaism and Hellenism is to start saying, well, Judaism is Hellenistic. And this is also a contributor to what we think about when we talk about Hellenism. While Judea and the surrounding area had been part of the dominion of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt for over a century, they had been incorporated into the Seleucid Empire by Antiochus III, Antiochus IV's father, in 198. Why then did a culturally conservative or maybe even anti-Hellenistic movement like the Hasmoneans emerge a shortly while after Epiphany's takeover? Did the policy of Antiochus IV or the Seleucids in general differ significantly from the Ptolemies to create such hostility, or had resentment to Greek rule been building up for decades up to the time of the Maccabean Revolt? There, again, we can pick apart a couple different questions in there to approach. I think the first thing to say quite briefly is that as far as I'm aware, Ptolemaic and Seleucid civil authority and particularly taxation systems differed. We have some documentation from the 3rd century, about the middle of the 3rd century, in the Xenon papyri, which you may have come across. But these essentially are bureaucratic dealings of grain prices and the travelling Xenon, this figure going around and what he was getting up to. But we get a bit of an insight into a highly organised and effective system of resource exploitation and extraction that the Ptolemies were very effective in setting up. In terms of conflict, I think one thing that's important to think about is when we're talking about ancient Judea, what do we mean? And this is often quite a loose idea and changes over time and depending on which author you might read in antiquity. So we have in the Persian period, this Persian Yehud, this restructuring of presumably a tribal structure based around Jerusalem as Judah. The Persian Yehud then is another administrative region around there, and kind of the borders that differ, and slowly this becomes Judea. And initially in this period, it isn't very big. Maybe it stretches to the Jordan in the east, doesn't stretch to the coast in the west, slightly south of Jerusalem, and then north into Judean foothills, but doesn't get as far as Samaria. So this is quite a small region. As a people group, these Judeans, these Jews, 
aren't particularly notable amongst all the other peoples who are part of these kingdoms and empires. And we do know that Jews were serving, I think, in the Battle of Banias, where Antiochus III took control of this region of the southern Levant as mercenaries. So they were involved just another ethnic people group amongst many. Once in, you know, as you say, 198, this uh, change happens. This is kind of the first time the Seleucids are in charge, and it's quite an important strategic you know, link uh, along the eastern Mediterranean. Lots and lots of wars have historically been fought over that region. Now, the Seleucids, as far as I know, there's a scholar who's written on the economy of Seleucids, Apergis, I think, but that details all of that. As far as I'm aware, the taxation structure is a lot less robust and they have slightly different approaches to administrative authority. We've got a bit of a power change in terms of how noticeable this is at the temple. I'm not sure terribly well how, when we're talking about Judea in this period, it's a temple state that main authorities are the high priests of the Jerusalem temple. One temple in the region seems to have gained this premier status that even Jews, Judeans, I keep using these terms kind of interchangeably in this period because there's a bit of scholarly argument about when do we start having a conception of Judaism that makes sense because all these conceptions like talking about ethnicity, nationality, religion in the ancient world are all really tricky terms so I'm deliberately being a bit vague <laughs> that might help us explaining why this temple kind of gains preeminence and by some accounts is relatively wealthy because the diaspora Jews all around the ancient Near East all around the Mediterranean also contribute towards its upkeep this high priest is in a position where it's hereditary so father to son and what seems to happen under Antiochus III and under Seleucus his son the high priesthood seems to become there's like an understanding that develops where the high priests pay almost some kind of tribute to the king and money is definitely a huge motivating factor when we're talking about any of these Seleucid rulers in the aftermath of the Roman defeat because the war indemnity was just gigantic and we are aware that Antiochus IV, even 30 years later, is still paying off some of this war debt. And this also might help explain why he has a bit of a perchance for temple robbery. So there we are. But this high priesthood gets involved somehow. And they are, I don't know if deputised is the right word, but there's this kind of devolved system of local rulers being brought in at various kind of different stages into this overall imperial power structure that's the kind of setup maybe some of the changes we see what we see involved in this relationship between the high priesthood is that new high priest so we, we have this Onias the high priest um, he's the fourth one I think by this point so that's been in the family for a while he is kind of outbid for the high priesthood by a man called Jason and Jason is talked about in many of these sources but first Maccabees is open in front of me it seems to be by the accounts in first and second Maccabees that some of these high priests and authoritative figures start to introduce practices that were unfamiliar at that point in Jerusalem but we would perhaps recognize as Greek let's say for want of a better word or Hellenistic so I mentioned earlier the gymnasium so we have this they're not named in first Maccabees but there are certain renegades uh, came out of Israel and misled many so they also do all other kinds of things there's a bit of a vague abandoning the holy covenant unclear what that means but essentially there, there seems to be a bit of a problem with a group of what have been termed Hellenizers in Jerusalem that the sources and to just really hammer this home, the sources that were written from the perspective of the people who came out on top over these groups portrayed them as doing so, abandoning laws of the fathers, this kind of stuff. And then we also get a couple other high priests who Jason's disposed by another high priest who uh, offers even more money. And it seems as though maybe some of this temple sacking of Antiochus potentially was well, he was just taking the money that he was owed by the high priest 
So as I'd mentioned after this kind of humiliating encounter with the Romans, uh, he returns, I think this is 169, returns on his way back from Egypt, passes through Jerusalem, and it seems to be in a state of turmoil. So the city seems as though it was in a, maybe the midst of a local crisis or maybe a mini civil war between certain supporters of one high priest over another. And then Antiochus clearly is not happy with that, takes treasures from the temple and is said to set up this abomination of desolation as I mentioned before. And there's a bit of argument about what that was. I've argued that at least this term as it appears throughout Daniel, and particularly the Greek translations of Daniel, is a pun. And it's a pun based on Antiochus's divine title. Much like the arrogant one, the Hupophanes, the desolation is an apophanes, so like they're kind of playing with this visible part of the Greek term. But some people say it's it's an altar, some people say it's a statue. We can talk a bit more about this statue idea in a bit. Some people say, you know, maybe he just sacrificed there. It's all a bit unclear, but the kind of message that's gone down throughout history is that he profaned the temple. The, none of our sources are appreciative of whatever he did. He sets up a garrison of kind of Syrians there. So this, you know, Syrians are kind of the word that tends to be used for the Seleucids at this time in a lot of the Jewish texts. It sets them up and takes off. And a letter comes, which is supposedly preserved in some places, I think, if I remember rightly, but essentially bans various practices that the authors of First Maccabees suggest are essential practices for Jewish practice. In First Maccabees, these include they should sacrifice to idols, they should not observe the Sabbath, so the seventh day of rest, they are forbidden for burnt offerings, sacrifices, drink offerings at the sanctuary, forbidden to do festivals, they've got to build altars all over the place and sacrifice unclean animals, and they're not to circumcise their sons. So this long list and litany tells us a little bit about the kinds of expressions of ancient Judaism that First Maccabees considers to be quite important. They may also tell us about some of the practices that Antiochus proscribed. One question is where did he get this list from? Because we don't know of any reason why he would have that much insight into why banning these things would matter or be a punishment to this population. So there is the potential that this was what one of the Hellenizing high priests said and this is something to make all our people get on. We have everyone observe the same customs, that people observing different customs can be a source of tension, for instance. So maybe that's part of the idea. These rules come out, we get a kind of a handful of early martyrdom narratives. Martyrdom is essentially a developing concept and really the books of the Maccabees are some of the first literature in the Jewish tradition, as far as I'm aware, that really express this idea of dying for the sake of the law or not breaking these kind of covenants of God. So we get a lot of this kind of literature, we get famously uh, Second Maccabees 7, where we have these kind of mother and her seven sons who are each tortured in turn, all before the king and they're each questioned and all of them die gladly and then find the mother does as well. So there's this idealising of pacifist resistance. So this seems to be happening. And what happens in the midst of this is First Maccabees reports that there is a family in First Maccabees 2 who are a priestly family. Importantly, they're not a high priest family. But they're a priestly family um, whose patriarch is this figure called Matthias. They have settled in Modain from Jerusalem and they are very upset with these rules that the Seleucid officials are enforcing. So in 2 Maccabees 2, one of these officials comes to Modain, demands that they make sacrifice there. Matthias is very indignant about this, doesn't like it at all. But once he's said, well, we won't obey, we won't turn aside from our religion, another Jew comes forward and he's ready to sacrifice. So Matthias kills him and kills him on the altar. Then they go on a bit of a rampage and him, all his sons and anyone else who joins him goes out and hides in the hills. 
they become this guerrilla force. And the early kind of reports of the revolt seem to be snowballing from there. The books of the Maccabees place particularly this one son, Judah, or Judas Maccabee, as the prominent figure in the early days of the revolt. The name Maccabee is actually a nickname, so it means the hammer, which is a pretty good nickname. I I really like that. (laughs) But so Judah leads this group, which seems to be one of several groups. We also have reports that the Seleucids are attacking people on the Sabbath and people were refusing to fight on the Sabbath. So there is a decision reported that the Maccabees make and say, okay, we we will fight on the Sabbath because otherwise we'll die. There also is another group who are referred to as the Hasidians. We don't really know anything about this group, but they are another group that is violently resisting this. So there seems to be lots of these insurrections, rebellions, armed groups about in the region. And this really then becomes the Maccabean revolt. Whether all groups kind of join together or not, it's a bit unclear, but Certainly what seems to have happened is that in the local region, um, Judah in particular was quite uh, successful in a number of his battles, or at least didn't lose anything too badly. And local authorities, so there are reports of Seleucid generals and the like and commanders facing them, figures like Nicanor, some defeats, some victories, but ultimately they seem to gain the upper hand. They recapture the Jerusalem temple and rededicate it in 164 and thus the festival of Hanukkah begins although really doesn't take off as a major thing. During this time Antiochus seems to be largely ignoring what's going on. Either he's unaware of lots of what are probably in the grand scheme of the Seleucid Empire quite small scale skirmishes or he's got other things to think about because this is really the century where the Seleucid Empire is starting to fracture and like I say you'll know much more about this than I do but this region is not alone in starting to push the bounds of Seleucid hegemony. They go on a number of these brothers the sons of Matthias die, Judah dies, eventually a figure called Jonathan is on the scene and he becomes high priest I think Judah actually is the first to become the high priest when he rededicates the temple. But this family is now entrenched as the high priest in Jerusalem. Jonathan's the high priest. He gets involved in lots of Seleucid and Ptolemaic political intrigue. I think he's assassinated at a Ptolemaic wedding banquet or something to make for a great Game of Thrones style thing. We then have another brother called Simon who lasts for a bit longer and is a high priest. Seems to be given some kind of official position. So first Maccabees 15, I think. Simon is granted the right to mint coins. He seems to be raised to one of the king's friends because in the meantime, what's been going on with the Seleucids is Antiochus IV has died, plundering another temple, incidentally, off elsewhere in his empire. Then there is a bit of a struggle. His young son, Antiochus V, I think, is on the throne. But then we get his brother's son, Demetrius, is on the scene, takes power. Another pretender to the throne, potentially this, I don't know, ancient ancient authors and modern scholars generally think he was completely making it up. But Alexander Ballas comes and says he's the son of Antiochus IV. Civil war, lots of conflict and this prominent family in Judea is able to navigate a lot of that and gradually take on more power for themselves. They'll help and pick a side in the Seleucid civil wars. They are granted more and more land and more rights. Simon's son, John Hyrcanus I, becomes high priest and he does start minting coins. We have lots and lots of examples of his coins all over the place. Seizes more territories. His sons then conquer the greatest extent, the Hasmonean kingdom, and they start calling themselves kings. But all of this, all of the things they're doing, really engages in lots of quote-unquote Hellenistic culture. So they engage in politics with the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, they get involved in wars, they recruit mercenaries to establish their own power. Josephus tells us that the Hasmoneans were forcefully converting other people groups in the region like the Idumeans and the Etrurians 
Um, there's a bit of debate about what this means, but this included like forceful circumcision. So they themselves start imposing what we would also perhaps see as religious cultural customs on people who they conquer. We start to see some of this maybe ideas around drawing people groups, polities, nations around customs that we would now term religious seem to happen. So but that then it goes off on there and I could keep going because I really like talking about the Maccabees and what ends up happening to them or Hasmoneans sorry should have explained as well the Maccabees a lot of people refer to them as it's just Judas's nickname the Hasmoneans are the family name so one of Matthias's ancestors whether his father his grandfather something like that is meant to be called Ashmanias so we get this term Hasmoneans as the kind of dynasty name for them. Following the period after the Maccabean revolt did time soften the attitudes towards Epiphanes or did he become a larger than life figure in the Jewish tradition akin to a Nero or a Caligula for the Christians? Oh yes Oh yes, so there's some quite interesting things that seem to happen. I'd kind of alluded a little bit earlier to a statue in the temple. So this particular phrase, abomination of desolation, or abomination that desolates, has a ongoing history in Jewish and what will become Christian texts, um, and kind of becomes a stand-in in some places for things like the Antichrist. So how do we get from there? Well, as I'd said, Antiochus's personal, again, I'll use the term religious with the caveat that please forget all you think you know about what religion is in the ancient world, but Antiochus's religious proclivities seem to include a particular fondness for Zeus, and this maybe causes a bit of a stir, The kind of one of the patron gods of the Seleucid household, previously was Apollo, Zeus starts to appear a lot on Antiochus's coins and his title Epiphanes because it is divine manifest there is a indication and it is drawn from sources like Polybius who call him mad, Daniel and Maccabees who talk about him acting with the pretense of a god when he is just a little horn, these kind of things and some of the iconography on his coins there's a suggestion that he sets himself up in the position of a god, which isn't the first time that an ancient king has done this. That is a long tradition of, and I actually even see that you have a wonderful logo of Alexander coin with the Amon horns. So you have this divinization in the iconography of Alexander as a god. This statue is one way to explain what this phrase means, but I think it's worth tracing the idea of temple profanation down through the next couple centuries of Jewish history and then some of the pieces of it seem to be maybe from other sources. Let's start the proposition that Antiochus set up a statue of Zeus in the Jerusalem temple. There's no explicit claim to this in any of the texts but it's been a suggestion and I think the suggestion in later texts that this happened is drawing from later events like notably Caligula or Gaius this member of the Claudian family around in the 40s CE is reported to have wanted to set up a statue of himself in the Jerusalem temple and this sparks according to Josephus like a, a kind of a wave of um, rebellion a bit of protest all around the place the local governor of the region essentially says this is a really bad idea and one of the Herodian kings, Agrippa, who is friends with Caligula, I think eventually talks him out of it, or at least postpones it, and then Caligula is assassinated, so we're prevented from that happening. But the suggestion and the intent of doing that is kind of in the air. And then we get the reception of this abomination language in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And towards the end of them, around the Passion section, so the final week of Jesus' life. He, in Jerusalem, is using lots of this language about abomination of desolation and is talking about the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. This might feed into when we think some of these texts might have been written or in the forms we have them it might have come to us because I think in the Matthew version or the Lucan version this seems to have adapted Mark's version slightly to resemble more what actually happened in 70 CE 
when the temple was destroyed during Titus' siege of Jerusalem. This idea then carries on through. We have Revelation. I think it comes up again that the Antichrist does this kind of thing. I'm not a Revelation scholar, so I don't really know. But again, we have this idea planted of an opponent to God. And then later in antiquity, we have a author called Porphyry who writes a commentary, I think an attack on the Jews think is a pagan author and then Jerome maybe best known for writing the Latin translation of the Bible the Vulgate has a commentary on Daniel where he refers to some of Porphyry's work and all these strands of the Antichrist of statues in the temple of the abomination desolation come together in one place here Jerome talks about because Porphyry is saying or obviously we know that Daniel was talking about Antiochus it's not talking about some future prophecy and Jerome says that essentially Antiochus is like one of a typology so Antiochus is the first Caligula is another and the Antichrist will do the same so there's a cyclic historical thing going on and all of these figures and their actions become condensed so things like the pretense to godhood which was also said about Caligula and the statue and general opposition really much much later seems to coalesce when we look at Antiochus's actions and his general career more broadly he seems to be reasonably competent you know he leads some military campaigns to good success maybe this reflects more on his opponents but reasonably competent he's got a good sense of his public persona so he has this great Pompey, these parades, military parades, and shows off his vast wealth. He seems to delegate lots of his responsibilities reasonably well, and generally, when measured up against particularly a lot of the successors that came after him, is a reasonably competent Seleucid ruler. And then the question then becomes what reason does he have to A, set himself up as a god, B, put a big statue in the temple? So there's this other element that creeps in that maybe this crept in because he was also known to be a patron, as I said, of Zeus and put a lot of money into trying to have the Olympus Zeus temple built at Athens. Incidentally, another imperial figure who had become a great enemy of ancient Jews would complete that temple and that's Hadrian. So we also get these other figures who are involved in lots of the same things he does. Hadrian does ban Jewish practice, all these kind of things. We get lots of these figures who in later history had particularly negative, cruel, difficult relations with the Jewish people. And Antiochus seems to have established a mode in which attacks on these particular customs could come. And then also seems to have received lots of reflections from people who followed his style. But he didn't necessarily do all of the things that these sources seem to suggest he might have. I think this is an excellent place to leave our discussion. But once again, I'd just like to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk on the show and before we go are there any future projects you're working on or any websites or platforms you'd like to share sure and i'd say also thank you for having me i do listen to the show i really enjoy it it gives me much more contextualization for lots of my own research so thank you for your work in terms of things i'm doing but i'm part of a podcast collective we're called ancient afterlives and we essentially talk about all things ancient world mostly so far we've done one season it's been lots of biblical studies I'm talking about things like the dead sea scrolls talking about it for instance the kind of first episode was a test one so i just was the guest and talked about hasmeans and bathhouses I'm, I'm much more on this hellenism judaism thing so if people are interested in that then check that out that's ancient afterlives we're on twitter we're on most podcast platforms in terms of other things i've got a few open access articles which people might be interested in they can find me on twitter and most things will be linked from there but i have a humanities commons depository where i try to put up most of my work there's also academia.edu that signpost where lots of things are the next project I'm interested in is going to be thinking about ancient Judaism and warfare. This is something I'm just kind of doing in my spare time as I'm full-time employed, not in an academic job anymore. And so I'm just writing and thinking and we'll see what comes next. Who knows? <laughs> Fantastic. Then I'll make sure to definitely include all these links, including links to the podcast in the episode description and the show notes on my website. 
But well, thank you to once again for joining us today. And for the rest of you, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>